I'm Nancy Gibbs. I'm the director of the Shorenstein Center here at the Kennedy School and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, where we find ourselves in the middle of a historic news cycle talking about how to save the news. What needs to happen to ensure that a free press, the only constitutionally protected industry is strong and safe and free enough to perform its critical role. I can't think of anyone better to explore this challenge than Harvard's 300th anniversary university professor and former Dean of the law school, Martha Minow, whose new book, Saving the News, why the Constitution calls for government action to preserve freedom of speech, argues that the First Amendment not only doesn't preclude the government from protecting a free press when it gets into trouble, but actually requires that it do so. Martha is gonna lay out her provocative and very timely argument, and then bravely subject herself to interrogation by an all-star team of journalists and scholars uh, we will be joined by Sewell Chan, the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune and the former editorial page of the Los Angeles Times, by Steve Waldman, who's chair of the Rebuild Local News Coalition and the co-founder of Report for America, and Dr. Joan Donovan, who's the research director at the Shorenstein Center and runs its technology and social change project. Martha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nancy, and everyone who's made this event possible. At the close of the convention in 1787, after delegates approved and signed the United States Constitution, a lady asked Benjamin Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And Franklin replied, a republic, if you can keep it. That question remains haunting, and especially now. Informed and active citizens are a crucial ingredient for a political order that is controlled by the people who select representatives and also critical to public health and safety during a pandemic. And yet the one and only institution mentioned by name, as Nancy said, in the constitution, the press is in serious jeopardy. By directing that Congress make no law abridging freedom of the press, the First Amendment to the Constitution assumes the existence and durability of this industry. The press at that time meant newspapers produced and distributed through private means. Owners and operators of presses like Benjamin Franklin published accounts of the day. And Tom Je Thomas Jefferson wrote his friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, the only security of all is a free press. The authors of the First Amendment thought it was important to single it out as a bulwark of uh, liberty. And yet news right now, as we know it, is at risk. So therefore, and for other reasons too, is democracy. Changes in the private industry of the press have left hundreds of communities with literally no local news. Half of local communities now have only one newspaper and most of those are only once a week. Readers and revenues have shifted to online, national, or global platforms, or none at all. Newspapers and broadcasters in small cities and towns have shut down or sold to chains or private equity investors who in turn strip mine them and jeopardize journalism. Most people in the United States receive news selected for them by computer-based algorithms based on their past interests or their demographics and are producing echo chambers, digital gerrymandering with few opportunities to learn, understand and hear what others are believing and indeed have a common reality. Legacy media, the traditional media have shrunk. Fewer than one third of those who have surveyed uh, trust news to be reported accurately. And this is the lowest number since surveys have begun. Then we have misinformation, spreading and even disinformation. The disclosures about Facebook's processes by a whistleblower raise even further grounds for distrust. How can we have democracy when news and information are not shared and not reliable? There's no simple solution. Uh, to these very complex problems. And added to the difficulty right now, the Supreme Court's regard for the press is at its lowest in history, which is a further cause for concern. 
let's let me say a little bit more about this situation and then also talk about the role the government has played actually in shaping the media up until this moment. And I will identify a set of proposals and mostly hope to hear from the panelists and you all about your ideas. Because most people find their news through an online algorithm rather than human edit editors, most people also do not pay anything for getting their news. The for-profit model of newspapers was largely supported by advertising and it doesn't work as the ad dollars shift to Craigslist and to targeted online advertising on platforms uh, where 90% of the online advertising goes to Google or Facebook. And 65% of the users who con come in contact with news uh, that is reported by uh, actual news sources do not leave Google to click through to the newspaper's actual websites. And Google and Facebook capture the vast majority, therefore, of the advertising dollars. The owners of newspapers and big digital platforms alike can choose not to invest in the news and therefore not to have any constant flow of local government accountability. And I'm haunted by stories about uh, what happens as a result. Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown shot by the police, led to investigations expo exposing how the local courts relied on fines and fees on the backs of poor people. Turns out that Ferguson, Missouri had no daily newspaper, no news blog, no local television, nobody reporting on what was going on. Another example, Flint, Michigan, lead in the water, whistleblower, public health expert, uh, surprised me by saying, actually, we were lucky. And I asked why? Uh, and she said, well, the discovery of lead represented a major crisis, but she said, we have good local news. And she went on to say there are hundreds of Flint, Michigans out there without local news. So we just don't know about them. Mainstream journalism for four decades after World War II was dominated by three national networks. They weren't perfect, um, but they did help at times to unify the country and to create some kind of a shared understanding of what was going on in the country and in the world. Local news uh, organizations have consolidated and actually are in much more jeopardy even than the national broadcasters or cable. And one interesting feature is that protects the digital platforms that are themselves often manipulated by propagandists and extremists is that these platforms under US law are insulated from liability. The liability that attaches to newspapers and television stations, they can be held liable for defamation or for false information or threats or sexually explicit material or racially discriminatory ads. But under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, the internet platform providers are not held liable. And at this time of partisan rancor in the United States, there's actually surprising convergence between Republicans and Democrats that something's wrong with this situation. What's less, less well known maybe is the critical role that the United States government has played in shaping our current system. The postal system from the early days of the Republic uh, allowed for distribution of newspapers, pamphlets, and Congress gave the, these media discounted rates and even free distribution when the media were sharing their materials with each other. This resulted in thousands of exchange copies being uh, shared in the 1840s. State and local governments refrained from taxing newspapers. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, the business of gathering and sharing news proved resilient and helped build commitments to a professional journalism. And during that time, uh, there were large urban papers that investigated uh, crowded housing, tainted food, uh, and uh, helped to support uh, law reforms. Advertising revenues replaced party, political party financing for these media. And economies of scale allowed uh, for the profits. Um, and the shape of the media ecosystem, though, reflected government subsidies. The governments financed the telegraph line starting in the 1840s. Federal and state governments gave the transcontinental telegraph rights to use public lands. 
when broadcast started, first radio, then television, of course, this was organized by the government and uh, very low fees for the licenses uh, in exchange for some public service obligations. Uh, the, the, including the fairness doctrine requiring broadcast networks to host contrasting views on issues of public importance. The federal government still regulates cable and requires cable service providers to carry local stations and not submerge them under national content. Federal support for public media is another important feature and it's amplified by the tax deductible treatment of private donations. And the Congress required manufacturers to increase the channels and make room for public educational broadcasting. United States government has required telecommunications companies to provide universal service to subsidize broadband. Uh, the first algorithm behind Google was financed by a National Science Foundation grant. The internet was invented by uh, government researchers at ARPANET, the precursor, uh, ARPANET, the precur and, and it was uh, subsidized uh, by DARPA. Um, the government actually protects speech on the internet, but antitrust enforcement has always been available and been used throughout uh, the last century to promote competition uh, and to create exemptions where it seemed to be in the public interest. So the government has helped to contribute to the world we're now in. The government obviously created the exemption from liability that I mentioned before, which operates as a kind of subsidy for the internet platforms. What do we do? There's no easy fix. There are a variety though of possibilities. And my central point is if we don't do anything, the predicate of an informed citizenry is at jeopardy and therefore so is our constitutional order. I've identified about 15 policies. They fall into three buckets. I'll describe the buckets. The first is to treat the dominant digital platform companies as if they were responsible actors. That means halting or modifying their current immunity from liability. Also, they should be required to pay for news that's written by others and that's circulating, posted by the platform company or by third parties. Australia and the European Union have already started to do just this. And we can draw lessons from the music industry and how the digital disruption, which initially seemed to devastate uh, the music industry, uh, righted itself by charging a reasonable fee. A bipartisan bill pending now in Congress would give publishers a tool to balance the media marketplace without government censorship. This is the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. It would create a narrow exception from antitrust liability and allow news organizations to organize and negotiate with the big temp com tech companies for fair compensation for the use of their content. Um, a second bucket uh, is to protect users readers, consumers, uh, enforce terms of service agreements, which currently are not enforced. Uh, actually enforce contract tort law, consumer protection laws, laws against deception and fraud on the internet, require the removal of fake accounts, um, actually require disclosure of where messages are coming from and transparency about choice architecture and the curation of the platform social media. Open up competition over content moderation, sometimes called middleware, require the internet companies to allow others to compete with them in this moderation activity. Those are just some examples of consumer protection. And a third bucket would be to support, amplify and sustain a variety of public interest news media, local, regional, national, and also media education. There could be a tax on internet companies with the revenue set aside to support public alternatives. Public media is uh, very often identified as the most or among the most trustworthy news organizations in the country. Um, and there could be some adjustment actually to help them uh, adapt to the current uh, situation, adjust the rules regarding underwriting practices, for example, and revise Copyright Act treatment so that public media reflect the new distribution platforms. Um, amplify tax exemptions for philanthropic aid. 
Uh, and the Local New Sustainability Act uh, uses that idea and some others. And I hope Steve Waldman will talk about that because he's a true expert. Um, I think that the possibility of media education has uh, been demonstrated already as an important uh, tool for cultivating critical reading and understanding of news and distinguishing, questioning what's misinformation. It also helps to grow interest in media uh, and uh, digital media literacy is associated with greater political engagement and exposure to diverse viewpoints. None of these proposals alone, and even all of them together, is going to reverse the situation in which we find ourselves. But all of them could make a difference, and all are constitutional. None of them intrude on freedom of speech, and all build on steps, step, steps that have been taken in the past. The Supreme Court of the United States itself has said that the First Amendment ensures access to information, not just the freedom to speak, but also the freedom to access information. Right now, if unless there's government action, that access is very much jeopardized, as are the values underneath our governmental system. Government action and support of civic organizations is necessary also to overcome the demise of the news industry. Nonprofit news, an important player right now. Somebody once said that the Constitution is an experiment. Life itself is an experiment. This experiment may not succeed. And frankly, the success of this experiment depends upon people like all of you engaging in these issues and breathing new life and energy into the Constitution and its aspirations for liberty, equality, and self-governance. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Martha. You've given us a lot to chew on and a lot to think about. I'm delighted that the first question or comment or pushback even is going to come uh, from Newton Minow, who uh, in addition to being Martha's father is a legend uh, uh, at the Kennedy School and at Harvard and throughout the media ecosystem as it has evolved over the last 50 years. He distinguished lawyer, a presidential medal of freedom recipient, professor emeritus at Northwestern and chaired the FCC under President John F. Kennedy. So uh, Mr. Minow, you get the first question. Nancy, thank you. I'm very happy to be back at the Kennedy School at the Institute of Politics. I was there in 1986 when we created the Commission on Presidential Debates. And Martha asked me to write the preface to her book, which I titled From Gutenberg to Zuckerberg, and tried to give an overall historic perspective on some of the issues. Martha's main point, and the point that I agree with completely is that in the words of Justice Jackson at the Supreme Court, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Martha points out that the Constitution favors, favors, that's the only institution that favors the, and protects the press. Uh, I want to give you one example of what can be done. When I was chairman of PBS and Larry Grossman, who's well known to the Shorenstein Center, was president of PBS, we had a request from the State Department not to broadcast a program we had scheduled. The request of the State Department had come from the state from the Saudi Arabia, the, the ambassador from Saudi Arabia. Larry and I thought about it, and we thought about the future of public broadcasting. And we decided that we were going to broadcast the program, because if we didn't, if we didn't, we would lose our independence, and we did broadcast the program. It, my point is it's possible for the government to help the free press. It's possible. And what Martha's book has done, I think, is to answer the people who scream First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment. 
who do not understand the First Amendment. And that is, there's a basic misunderstanding about the First Amendment. And what Martha's book, and I hope will deal with this, and my, my question to Martha is what in the Constitution, what in the Constitution asks the government to protect the free press? Well, the best part of my book is dad's preface. So uh, if anyone reads it, uh, that's the part to definitely read. Uh, I think that one of the methods of reading the Constitution that actually Justice Jackson helped to pioneer but is still dominant today is to look at the whole structure of the Constitution, see how the parts interconnect. And if one part is out of whack, then the constitutional analysis requires putting it in the right balance. And that's how I would understand what's uh, at stake right now. Uh, a lot of people, I think you're right, Dad, misunderstand the First Amendment and think uh, that the government can do nothing that affects the media. That's one reason I wanted to tell about the history where the government has been deeply involved in shaping the media and shaping through antitrust law. Who owns it? Where's their concentrated ownership is allowed and where it's not? And subsidizing it uh, back to the days of the Postal Service, the Telegraph, uh, and licensing it with the broadcast uh, media. Uh, and uh, the development of the internet, the development of algorithms uh, that now organize the news industry, this is all with government oversight. Um, the government is involved. Uh, so I think that it's uh, incredibly important to now say that's not a barrier. So what are the good ideas? I, I'm as scared as anybody about censorship. Your story, Dad, I wouldn't want the State Department or anybody in the government be tell, telling not just public media, any media, what to carry, what not to carry. But to disclose whether or not the algorithms that are being used uh, suppress some stories as opposed to others, that's not censorship. That's consumer protection. Thank you, Martha. And uh, let me ask Sewell and Steve and Joan to join us. Um, there are so many things I would like to ask Martha um, and ask each of you, but I also encourage you to put your questions to her where you take issue, where you would amplify. Um, let me start, as cameras turn on, with the question about your suggestion of the ways in which government could help sustain local news, whether it's through tax credits or other forms of subsidies or financing. Uh, how do you decide who counts, who's eligible? Does it include Infowars? Does it include Alden and the hedge funds? How do you, how do you channel the, that public revenue, even if we were comfortable with that idea to the places that need and deserve it most? Well, I'll leave it to you, Nancy. This is a critical question and it's one that Steve and I have uh, argued about and discussed and explored. I think that the focus, for example, of the Local News Sustainability Act is correct because by focusing on local news, you can come up with the criteria on Alden Capital isn't local. Uh, and you can come up with criteria about, is there a physical presence? Are there employees in the locale? Um, and I think that that would be a big guard. I still am worried and would be interested in the views of others. I'm worried about uh, those kinds of websites that disguise themselves as news when in fact they're propaganda or misinformation. Uh, Steve, I know you've given a lot of thought to some of the legislation that has been moving through Congress um, and are as knowledgeable as anyone about the, the, the difficulty of writing smart policy when it comes, even if we agree on the goals. Can you address that challenge? Yeah, well, first, thank you again for having me. And thank you, Martha, for writing this book, because it, the timing couldn't be better. And the making the case that it is both not only safe, but required that we help uh, sustain the free press it is more urgent than ever. I mean, the house is on fire when it comes to the crisis in local news. 
uh, you know, 57% decline in the number of reporters since 2004. And in fact, if you, I, I just, uh, for the fun of it, I the other day looked at that decline in the context of increases in state and local government spending. And if you look at it that way, the number of reporters per $100 million spent in a local government is down by 64%. Since twenty since two thousand and four, so and we know that when local news collapses, there's more corruption and more waste and less accountability, and and all those other things. So how do you do this? Is then is is then the tricky question? How because Martha's right that you know we should take that seriously. Like that this could be done very badly. You could do this in a way that could undermine press freedom and could have manipulation and or could undermine trust. You know, I remember reading when I was working on a book about religious freedom, Madison said he was opposed to any government support for religion. And he said he was afraid that if there was government support for a church, people would come to think of the Bible as a trick of the state. And I, you know, if you don't do this in the right way, you could end up with a softer form of harm, which is that people trust the media even less than they do, which is not saying much. So just to take a few of the points that Martha and New have mentioned on how to, on how you do this in a way that um, is First Amendment friendly and do, does the job. So first, actually, I think that, you know, the, the Post Office Act that Martha mentioned is a pretty good place to look for st creating standards for how to do this in a safe way. Why was that so popular and successful? It was content neutral. Yeah. It set universal standards. And to go to the point about you know, Sinclair and Alden, they honestly had a high degree of tolerance of horrible actors. I mean, Jefferson did not try to shut down the Post Office Act when all the Federalist Papers published horribly scurrilous and false, you know, accusations against them. And the Federalists didn't try to shut down. Well, they did actually try to shut down the, the Federalist Papers, but not through the Post Office Act. <laughs> they didn't try to do it through the Post Office Act. So, you know, you, I, I think that that's the reality is that if we're going to do something to help local news, we all have to have a, a, a certain tolerance for some tax support going to people we don't like. I think that's I think that is something we need to come to terms with. So, for instance, in the local journalism sustainability act, uh, the you know there are contours and and some limitations on size of corporations that limit how much would go to you know with, to all in and places like that. But the reality is, you know, if you're going to give money to local TV stations, some of that's going to go to Sinclair, and I think that's fine. I think that we actually have to be willing to do that and um, have in the, the greater good in the sense, in the same way that we like, you know, the charitable deduction. Like we, we you know, the charitable deduction subsidizes all sorts of charitable choices that people make, that other people make. I'm subsidizing their charitable choices, but I am fine with that because it helps to maintain the nonprofit sector. I think we're going to have to look at it the same way when it comes to local news. And I don't want to keep talking, but we can, you know, there are other ways of getting at the so-called pink slime sites uh, that Martha was alluding to, or that you were alluding to Nancy about, you know, other just kind of fake or fraudulent or dark money driven websites. Yeah. So, Sewell, you're before uh, coming to the Texas Tribune, you, your illustrious career moved from the New York Times and sort of traditional newsrooms to the LA Times, which was rescued by billionaire philanthropist Patrick Souchong to now the Texas Tribune, which is a, a nonprofit. So you have you have lived in the different business models. And I'm wondering what you think are the pros and cons of newsrooms being rescued by government versus billionaires versus private philanthropy? And is there something to prefer of one rescue mission over another? Nancy, I am for anything that supports the jobs of journalists. Uh, I am ecumenical in that sense. I, I'm first of all, I'm really honored to be here. And Martha's book is really a 
very important one. I think it's the, one of the most significant books I've read about journalism in a long, long time, because it really walks through the history and the law and makes very, very clear that, um, uh, you know, it makes a very, very compelling case. It not, I'm not certain that lawmakers and courts will listen, but the case is very, very compelling. Nancy, um, I didn't mean to be too, too glib an answer. Look, I started my career uh, at the Washington Post and at the New York Times. These were when they were both, as the New York Times still is, family controlled public companies. And that's an important part of understanding media history, whether it was the Binghams of Louisville or the, um, I think the Blethens in Seattle, the Chandlers in Los Angeles. And some of these families were more good or less good than others, but leaving that aside, many of the institutions of 20, the newspapers of the 20th century, many of them were really kind of family affairs. And they were really, you know, in my view, run with a kind of, um, you could call it paternalistic, but a kind of more or less benevolent capitalism. Now, of course, back then the economic model still worked, right? Many of these newspapers had local monopolies. All that has vanished. What has also vanished with it is that um, it is that kind of benevolent sense of stewardship. So I would argue that one thing you're seeing, we're seeing right now is a sense of revival of that stewardship. Uh, I had the chance to, I've had the chance to meet Mr. Stuart Bainham. He is a, Bolt, a Maryland based hotel magnate who had done very well for himself and wants to give back. He tried to buy the Baltimore Sun from Alden uh, Global Capital, uh, he failed. Uh, and more importantly, though, he realized that um, rather than being saddled by the legacy assets and problems of that esteemed publication, why not uh, use his money more effectively and has committed um, as part of a $50 million effort to create a new uh, uh, Baltimore-based uh, newsroom called the Baltimore Banner, which is being led editorially by my good friend, Kimi Yoshino, who worked with me at the LA Times. So Nancy, I, I don't, um, having worked for family-controlled companies, having worked for then a private, you know, totally privately owned uh, company. And I do credit Dr. Soon Chong a lot for his generosity in trying to bring the LA Times back to life. Uh, I am very, very happy with where I am right now, um, partly because I see nonprofit news as really one of the bright hopes in journalism. If you don't mind my asking a question of Martha, Nancy, would that be okay? You know, Martha, your proposals are so persuasive and well-argued, but I had to admit that I had a bit of a sinking feeling as I made my way through your book. We are, you are calling for investments in the public sphere itself, right? The kind of Habermasian ideal that undergirds the very possibility of civil society and democracy and democratic discourse but you're making this argument at a time of, profound, of a profoundly impoverished public sphere. The notion of public goods, the notion of we have to fix the tragedy of the commons, we've got to fix market failures. Um, you know, it is, um, th those ideas are struggling right now. This is not the New Deal and its aftermath. And this is obviously far from the New Deal era, despite the progressive possibilities that, that could be open right now. And then furthermore, you're writing your book at a time still, I would argue, of great kind of market fundamentalism. And you, you use the term even aggressive libertarianism to describe some of the orientation of the courts. You know, not like how, how Martha, do you encounter the challenge? How do you address the challenge of um, really kind of changing the dial? I mean, your book helps. But how do you how do you overcome these massive political obstacles? Well, you put it so well, uh, and I do thank you for your work, which is so uh, exemplary and encouraging. Uh, I I think at this moment uh, I'm grateful for federalism, because the huge libertarian turn of the federal courts is leading to curbs on what Congress is allowed to do. And I you know, shudder uh, because the hollowing out of any notion of public good is matched by these limits on what Congress is allowed to do affirmatively. So the New Deal, the progressive era legislation, these earlier periods of building the infrastructure of America, I'm not sure Congress would have the authority. Uh, we'll see, we'll see what this court does. But here is where states and locales have a critical role to play. And it's very striking to me that there are states, including Texas, including Massachusetts, that are exploring 
ways to actually help support the news. That said, I'm not giving up on the federal government. And as uh, the local news, uh, local journalism sustainability act is bipartisan. Uh, many of the reforms that I've been talking about, including the termination or alteration of immunity under section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is bipartisan. Um, so in a time of such unbelievable political rancor, there's a recognition by people who disagree about everything else that we cannot proceed unless we do something about the news crisis and the journalism crisis. So that, that gives me hope. Uh, federalism, uh, the decentralization gives me hope. The nonprofit sector, I, I just agree with you so strongly, it's critical. And it's one of the distinctive characteristics of the United States that we've had a thriving nonprofit sector, civil society. When de Tocqueville visited, he was stunned by the volunteerism, the numbers of organizations. That is a great strength of this country. And I look to it for one of the sources of hope right now. So Martha, you raised the bipartisan support for addressing section 230. So I'm gonna to torture Joan with her favorite topic. <laughs> pass, can and, I pass? <laughs> no, I, the reason I'm, I can't resist is because there, there are times where you have convinced me that as, as central as section 230 always is in this conversation, that, that Im the immunity is the problem. You have convinced me that that can also be a distraction from some of the real issues. So I now invite you to argue why Section 230 is not actually the thing that we should be most focused on. I'd rather like tell you what I had for dinner, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, Martha, I, I just want to say, uh, commend you on this heroic effort and dealing with all of these different topics uh, legalistically, because I'm I'm more of a cultural sociologist. I'm always looking for other ways through uh, the the policy gauntlet. In 230, you know, we have a bunch of people that have built their careers, lawyers in particular, on this uh, very small um, clause, uh, you know, suggesting that on the one hand, you have people like Danielle Citron that say Section 230 means uh, platforms can do any kind of content moderation that they want. On the other hand, you have a libertarian point of view that says Section 230 means uh, platforms shouldn't do any content moderation at all. And here we are in a very pivotal moment. Um, my team right now uh, is tracking uh, not just what the platforms are doing, but what what broadcast cable companies are doing to deplatform and remove Russia Today and Sputnik and other state-run media from Russia. And I can't help but believe that if we didn't all have a common enemy to look at in Russia, that none of this would be happening at the platforms, none of the broadcast agencies would be, you know, clamoring that uh, RT and Sputnik are, are you know, propaganda wings of, of Putin's uh, military invasion. And so, as we think about 230, of course, it's a very uh, American way uh, to view the internet and to view the role that the internet has come to play in all of our lives. Whereas in other places, uh, 230 is not the conversation. The conversation is about privacy. The conversation is about uh, data sharing. But when it comes down to news, you know, I think one of the things the new that news gave up very early on was the dream of distribution online. You saw news organizations just pat, you know, there were business model after business model that just weren't working and they kind of passed the distribution on to social media. And then social media companies were like, we're just going to put advertising around all of your links and we are going to just mop up you know, millions and in, in tens and hundreds of millions of dollars while you struggle to exist. And we're going to have no public interest obligation to the rest of you. And Section 230 doesn't require any kind of uh, public interest obligation or even content moderation in the public interest. So 
Nancy, I dodged a little bit, but you did see I mentioned 230 at least five times. So I'm going to keep your feet to the fire and nice try, Joan. Um, but but I would also like to pull an audible like Stuhl did and ask, you know, uh, <laughs> Professor Minow is it, what are we going to do yeah. really about, you know, the the online information commons you wrote uh, should be stable. You said stable, secure and substantial uh, when it comes to funding the information comments. I'd like a job that's substantial, stable, secure, right? How do how do we accomplish something like that? And you know, I'm, it's okay saying it's a it's a laudable goal, but getting there is going to be too much of a a hike. So Nancy, I'll try to take that one on. Thank you, Joan. Uh, uh, and also your comments on two thirty, I don't disagree with. Uh, it's one reason I really very much uh, favor improving uh, the world in which people who actually engage in journalism get paid for what they produce. And that includes allowing them to come together to negotiate with the internet platforms and not having the antitrust law applied against them when it's never applied against the internet companies. It's kind of unbelievable. Um, I, you know, stable, secure uh, information comments may be too much to hope for. But uh, if we don't strive for it, we're really in trouble. And the I should disclose, I'm on the board of our public media, GBH here, um, and we're struggling. But right now, you know, it's a mix of revenue. Uh, it's donations and it's memberships and it's other kinds of events. And, um, you know, just the way every media organization is struggling uh, and combining education and philanthropy um, but I think that the government has a role. One reason that the nonprofit model has to be a part of it is that uh, the, the tax deductibility of donations distributes the choices uh, about what to support. So it's not just the government picking. And I think that's really good in a country that values and needs pluralism. Um, we need plural sources of news. We need private providers of news. We don't want just government media. Um, and look, one very good feature about the internet platforms is that they can moderate. They can select. They are not governed by the First Amendment. It would be nice if some of them actually adhered to their own statements about their values, which they don't do. And here, the government has a role to play, which is to require them to disclose what their standards are and to report on their compliance with them. That's fully compatible with uh, everything that the government has been allowed to do in the securities and exchange area and other areas, environmental protection. Um, and you know, each of us click through these agreements and we have now signed away our data and we've agreed to terms of service that include the statement that they can change anytime. Now, that's a violation of consumer protection under Massachusetts law, under many, many state laws. And I think that those laws could be enforced and they could be strengthened. So you had another question. I know you wanted to. Uh, thank you. Um, Martha, this is maybe a bit of a provocative question, but it seems to me that some of the in some of the major ways in which government supported media in the 20th century were driven at least in part, not entirely, but in part by Cold War imperatives. Um, you know, Radio Free Europe, uh, um, uh, you know, Voice of America, even to some extent, Newton might disagree here, the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. There was, you know, a recognition of, you know, strengthening the American narrative. Um, could paradoxically the new information wars uh, and the rising geopolitical tensions between U.S. and Russia and China, you know, lead to a recognition, you know, as if the Macedonian trolls in 2016 weren't enough, but but could this new global environment, you know, possibly actually stimulate interest in improving the quality and durability of the American information ecosystem? You know, that's a very hopeful way to look at this terrible time. And I, I actually see some rays of hope in the sheer fact that in the last week, 
the unification of uh, the European countries and the United States at a time when people said this is just not going to happen. Uh, it's just remarkable. It's remarkable what a common enemy can do. Um, and I am not at all uh, uh, offended by pointing to the Cold War as a source of uh, government motivation. Take, for example, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the uh, decision by the United States Supreme Court often lauded as the best decision ever to uh, forbid racial segregation in public schools. No question had a Cold War dimension. The State Department urged the United States government to file a brief when the government was ambivalent about what to do uh, and said it's a propaganda point that the Soviets have against the United States that we have race segregation. So if the American way of life is to mean anything, standing up for it now is the time and it ought to mean support for free flow of information and critical analysis of news. Uh, we can't have self-government without it. And what a contrast with Russia, which is suppressing even the stories about the arrests of the protesters in Moscow. Uh, what a contrast with, the, with China, which actually controls the internet uh, in China. Um, so it is a moment to stand up for American values. And, and I think this is a bipartisan commitment. It can be. Uh, Steve, you had a question. Yeah, well, first, before I get to my question, I wanted to make Sewell less sad about the about the uh, partisan prospects, though the analysis is obviously true. But I was in Wisconsin recently testifying before the Wisconsin Assembly Ways and Means Committee, where the bill that they were considering was authored by a conservative Republican who was testifying in front of a conservative Republican in a bill that was endorsed by the Wisconsin Press Association and the small business groups, the restaurateurs and the all important Tavern League, which for those of you from Wisconsin that always uh, proudly say you still have the highest per capita beer consumption per block. The Tavern League endorsement is really important. And the bill that they're pushing is a tax credit for small businesses that advertise in local news. So it was very exciting because it proves that you can, you can frame these things in ways that when they're focused on local and they have a certain amount of uh, um, you know, amplifying the decision-making power of consumers and businesses, that it can, it can be bipartisan. Um, now, so my question is slightly changing topics, but going back to one of the other things you talked about, Martha, which is antitrust. Um, the antitrust, conversation about local news, I, I feel like the language of antitrust from the past doesn't work on the, the modern reality of local news. Uh, and I'm not talking so much about Google and Facebook in this case, I'm talking about the fact that depending on how you define it, half of the daily newspaper circulation in America right now is owned by private equity or hedge funds. And there's abundant evidence that that is part of what's you know, it didn't cause the problems, but it's certainly accelerating and making them worse. And yet, if you look at it through a traditional antitrust lens, it kind of doesn't work because yeah. they went from there being one paper before Alden took them over to one paper after Alden yeah. took them over, right? And the prices haven't changed. So there's no change in competition. There's no change in prices. And yet there sure is a harm to democracy and a harm to communities and a harm to consumers' welfare in a general sense. Um, and it seems to me that we, we need to rethink how we you know, think about antitrust as it relates to at least to local news. And I was wondering if you had, had solved that. I don't know about solved it, but I think it's very noteworthy that uh, President Biden has put in place a team at the Federal Trade Commission, at the Department of Justice, and in the White House of people who uh, actually are pointing out that the origins of the antitrust law focused on concentrated wealth and on the dominance of some over the many. And it was really a particular academic theory 
uh, that renovated the antitrust law and made it focus instead on consumer welfare and prices and ignore concentrated wealth. Well, right now we have in uh, the critical roles in the government, people who said, wait a second, this, that hollowed out the concerns of the antitrust law, the concerns about the threat to democracy. I hope they will have the political will to do something about it, but I agree. And that larger framework, that fundamental framework actually looks at the Sinclairs and the Foxes and all of these networks that actually control the source, the news that is circulating the information or opinion, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and so that in many parts of this country, that's all that's available. Uh, and that's not the vision that the framers had. That's not what democracy calls for. Again, though, I do think that a pluralistic solution is the only hope. Uh, so some piece of it would be a more vigorous uh, reading uh, and enforcement of antitrust. But another is to amplify nonprofit organizations, nonprofit news, another government subsidized news. Uh, another is, I think, uh, uh, actually universities and colleges, which right now are often the only people who are covering state capitals, are student journalists. Well, then maybe there ought to be some kind of support for them. Um, I'm very impressed by the work of groups like the News Media Alliance and others that are trying to support, uh, you know, nonprofit organization, nonprofit news. And I think the philanthropy, big philanthropy, has to step up, step up to the place right now, and they increasingly are. Uh, and so it's going to be a multi multi pronged solution. There's not going to be one answer, but antitrust is part of it. Consumer protection is part of it. Public utility framework for internet regulation is part of it. I, uh, speaking of students, I want to bring our students into the conversation. Um, and just a reminder, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Ask one brief question because time is tight. Uh, no speeches, questions end with a question mark. Um, and we're gonna start with Kayami from the college. Um, hi, thank you so much for speaking this evening. My name's Alice Kayami. I'm a first year in the college studying government. Um, and I'm asking a question this evening on behalf of the Harvard Independent. Um, you touched briefly about the role of the media in the international community, and I was wondering, um, especially as Russia continues to lead a war in Ukraine, what role does the international community have um, in deciphering between misinformation and propaganda uh, with what's actually the facts? Um, and how can you like connect the domestic politics um, and the domestic news with international news? Can I turn this to Joan? Joan, this is right up over the center of the plate. It's it's huge. I mean, the international community is necessary right now. There's so much we wouldn't know if not for the Ukrainian diaspora that is pumping out information, collating videos, uh, counting casualties, uh, transferring information between communities, sending resources uh, into Poland and, and other places that are accepting refugees, uh, holding that connective tissue of the community together. Uh, it's, it's absolutely important that uh, the international uh, media step up, US media step up and, and bring those stories out of uh, Kiev. But at the very same time, uh, we tried just to track uh, Ukraine as a hashtag on Twitter, and we had millions and millions of tweets after 10 minutes. It was going to be impossible to parse. So at this very same moment that we have this effusive uh, collective spirit of getting the word out there, it's mixed in, as the WHO called it at the beginning of a pandemic, it's an infodemic. It's mixed in with true, true information is mixed in with false information. And then you add that layer of intentional propaganda. Uh, Russia has been really trying to push this idea that that they're going in to denazify Ukraine, right? We had never really heard that word in uh, the US, uh, but that word, if you search for it online, goes to a bunch of propaganda about Ukraine. The last thing I'll say about this, and this is what's important about how we need better truth telling institutions. And I think, you know, Martha's book really points us to the loss of not just community and organizations that we feel when we have less 
um, local news to depend on. But the kind of propaganda that some of us are participating in out of love of a good meme, Zelensky is incredibly memeable. He looks like a superhero. He's very handsome. It's hard not to, to just share what you see. But the propaganda that's pro-Ukraine is actually downplaying the fact that we're not seeing bodies and we're not seeing dead people and we're not seeing gore. And in a war, that's the kind of stuff we need to see because those are the things that are going to turn the tide. Those are the things that are going to bring people out and protest. And those are the things that are going to uh, uh, push us in, in that direction, uh, in that spirit of liberty. And I would say that the, the, the depth of local media, because we don't have it, we're not getting that resonance. We're not getting those stories to hit in, in local areas. And so the last thing I'll say about that is there's another twist to the things that we've been discussing, which is, there's no such thing as local on the internet. I'll leave it at that. I have a small thought just I'll insert, which is I've been critical of the internet here, but the digital media does have some virtues. So citizen journalism uh, is a virtue at this critical time. Uh, and also when it's networked with, um, it may be an integrated approach with public media and nonprofit media. So for example, uh, public media has put out a call to people who have relatives or friends in Ukraine. Please share what you're hearing. And that kind of collation and moderation and, and integration of, of local, really local news uh, and this citizen journalism can be a real asset right now. Great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Alice, for your question. Next up is Jack from the college. Hi, thanks so much for all of the amazing info today. Uh, my name is Jack, I'm a first year at the college. Uh, my question is about the work that local news produces. Um, in the past couple of decades, it seems like some of the most impactful and high profile investigative journalism has come from local publications like the Boston Globe, um, reporting on the Catholic Church or the Miami Herald with the Epstein case. Um, so this might be a tough one to answer because we don't know what we don't know. Uh, but what are the areas of corruption in either the legal sphere, the political sphere uh, that we're not being exposed to, that we're not learning about um, because of the, the lack of local news coverage? Um, and what are areas that you think have been well explored by outlets like ProPublica or the Texas Tribune um, that are able to have support from other areas? Maybe Sewell wants to do that one. Uh, yeah, thanks for the really great question. I agree that local journalism is really the source of a great deal of accountability reporting. Um, much of investigative work nowadays is very interdisciplinary. In other words, it requires not just text reporters, but also visuals, multimedia, data visualization, data analysis. Uh, um, so, you know, the work is increasingly complex and there's often fewer and fewer resources. The bright spot is that there's a lot more collaborations. Just to take one recent example, the Texas Tribune partnered with Military Times to take a deep look at the Texas National Guard deployment to the U.S.-Mexico border by Governor Greg Abbott. And we were we don't have a military and veterans reporter, unfortunately, I'm, I'm hoping we can fix that someday. But we combined the military times as expertise with understanding National Guard with our, you know, local knowledges and our ability to reach, you know, Texans and really, you know, kind of produce this deep reporting. So I think the collaborations are a part of it. Um, I think the questioner is entirely right that there are, you know, that there are a lot of things being not being told. And um, part of it also, I, I would connect this to the fact that, you know, elections are becoming less competitive. There are few, that has been documented, there are far fewer competitive districts. Um, essentially, lawmakers are choosing their voters rather than the other way around. And, and that is very worrisome, I would argue, in any kind of one-party system. I was just talking with the editor-in-chief of Cal Matters, our California kind of counterpart, and we were talking about how we really need to do a look maybe together at the effects of one party rule. You know, in both states, you haven't really had um, the minority party having statewide office in really decades now. And, and what does that produce in a state? And, um, you know, and, and what does that mean in terms of accountability? And so, you know, there, there is so much to look at. I, I will I say, Jack, just as a note of encouragement, um, 
that we just at Shorenstein, we just uh, judged the this year's Goldsmith Awards in investigative reporting, and we'll be announcing the finalists um, in the coming days. And anytime I get depressed about the state of journalism generally and local news, particularly to see the extraordinary enterprise and determination and courageousness that even tiny newsrooms showing and the creativity with which they are now partnering with each other or with bigger newsrooms or with groups like ProPublica. There's a lot of collaboration going on. There's a lot of reinvention in how news gathering happens, particularly in this crucial area of public accountability journalism. And so even as all of this work is going on, it's very necessary towards trying to address the sustainability issue, the, the enterprise within newsrooms to continue to shine lights in dark places. Um, is as inspiring as it has ever been. I want to give the panel before we wrap up a chance for final thoughts that you'd like to share. Steve, why don't I start with you? Well, I guess the main point is that this is the moment where we, we sort of have a choice. We're at a we're at a crossroads. The, the disintegration of local news. Uh, there are signs that it's it's devolving to something that's kind of almost a worse version of what we had in the early days of our republic when there was a partisan press and we're, we're heading towards a, a tribal press and even on the local level. Um, and we're at a crossroads where we have to decide whether or not we want to create something better, I might be called a civic press, a press that is actually hopefully better than what we had before, a, a press that actually has an emphasis on the civic functions, especially local. And that will require, I think, probably three things. One is the development of better business models. Two is, as you said, a dramatic increase in the philanthropic support for local news. It's, it's growing, but I saw something the other day that among democracy funders, meaning funders that are funding election reform and who care about democracy, of the top 100 grants that they gave, one was for a local news organization. So democracy funders have to start viewing local news as an important part of democracy. And the third piece is what this book is about, is public policy. That has to be, this is like the third front, I think, in the effort to, to, to save journalism and local news and communities has to be um, really tackling urgently and quickly the public policy part. Thank you. Um, John. I don't know. I just work here, right? So, uh, no, I just want to say that I think it's, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to uh, really pressure platform companies to do better. Uh, they have an enormous share of the resources and as a result, you know, we can't keep leaning on philanthropists. We actually need to come up with systems that distribute the wealth, uh, especially because you have these journalists that are making incredible content, uh, huge contributions to our society. And then uh, all of the, the money that would go to run the newsroom and, and to pay their, their health insurance and whatnot, it's, it's evaporating. And we see these platforms getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they're able to control that first moment that someone starts a search, uh, you know, and they want to know something. And so I think public pressure is a really important tool that we have here uh, where we can ask for more from these companies that have essentially created a, mon a monopoly around advertising. And so I'd love to see Klobuchar and, and a few of other our other representatives really go in on antitrust in a, in a very in a very intense and, and thoughtful way, uh, just so that we can break out of this cycle. We're, we're in an innovation lock. Uh, there's just rot in terms of the way the system, social media systems are designed. And we're not actually doing our best. We're not innovating anymore. And so uh, we need that kind of uh, uh, shock to that system in order to compel new innovation. Thank you for that. Uh, Sewell. You know, I'm reminded of Pat Moynihan's observation that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And unfortunately, I feel we're in an era where people are not only picking the facts that suit their opinions, that support their opinions, but moreover, they're only exposed to facts. 
<laughs> that support their pre-existing worldviews. And that is what scares me so much. Martha's book has centered the, the fact that the Constitution has the, a free press, a strong press, an independent press as a predicate as a foundational kind of requirement for democracy itself. And I think that, you know, Martha, you've made me see things in really, really fresh ways, um, you know, through the lens of the constitution. And the fact is, you know, the, between the postal subsidies and, you know, things uh, in the past, the, the ways in which government has, you know, support, it's, it, this is not some, everybody in America tends to think everything's just a natural market. Well, no, markets are shaped by policymakers. There's a political economy here. And, and I just hope that the discussion broadens and I hope it really gets to the heart of the fact that we need a robust information system. Right now, the challenge, look, I, I used to edit opinion pages. I loved hearing debates and moderating them. Debates about values are great. The problem right now, but those to, for those debates to have meaning, there has to be a foundation of facts. And without a shared understanding right now of what are the facts, how can we possibly move to the higher order levels of debate? Thank you, Sol. And, and Martha, the last word is yours. Well, I've learned so much from everyone. Uh, sadly, we don't even share what are the topics. We're living in different universes. If you switch from one provider to another, they're not even talking about the same things, much less the same versions or the same facts. And uh, we can't be self-governing if we don't share the same world. We can't have a sense of our shared implication in each other's lives. I think my hope is that this conversation is part of many that are happening in many places uh, about the crisis and about the urgency. And as, as worried as I am, and I'm deeply worried, uh, I do see actually much more agreement, uh, particularly at the local level, People feel more of a sense of commonality when the snow has to be plowed on, on their, in their community and the garbage has to be picked up and the sanitation has to be developed. And I think working from the bottom up is, our, is gonna be one of our best hopes here. Uh, and uh, as well as holding accountable the big guys uh, and making them pay and, and shaming uh, those who are mistreating us and encouraging those who have the assets to help support uh, a stable, reliable news ecosystem. Thank you, um, Martha, so much for this book and for your historic leadership on this critically important question. Thank you to Sewell and Steve and Joan, to the Shorenstein and the uh, IOP teams for making this conversation possible. Um, this, for all the reasons that we've explored tonight, this area of the health of our information system and its critical place in the health of the body politic and of democracy is one that we're not gonna solve in a night. And in fact, for those of you who are interested in these hard questions, Shorenstein is launching a series in the coming weeks on news innovation, on creative ways of thinking about this problem. Um, it'll feature next Friday, March 11th, a fireside chat with an HKS alum, uh, John Heilman, who has uh, been an innovator and a leader in so many different chapters of the evolution of media as we try to, to perform in the public interest. And so I commend that and other events in the coming weeks to you. Go to the Shorenstein Center website if you wanna register for those. Um, and thank you all as participants, not just in this conversation, but as citizens and as consumers, as often creators of content, this is a transaction between um, audiences and content creators. And I think that this, we get the media we deserve. And, and in that sense, we need to both uh, take our responsibilities better of demanding the media that we need and all the ways that the government and the platforms and philanthropy all have a role to play in creating that information environment. Uh, with that, let me turn this back over to Mark Guerin. Nancy, thank you very much for moderating such a important conversation. And Martha, thank you for your important book and to Joan and Steve and Sewell for an engaging conversation with excellent questions. 
It was a particular privilege to have Newton Mim ask the first question. The Institute of Politics has pride of our association from when he was a fellow here and did the pathbreaking work on the presidential debates. So it was a pleasure to have both minnows part of this important forum. We invite you back tomorrow evening for an in-person forum here at 6 p.m. We will turn to the issue of COVID, bringing back the same panel uh, of experts and reflective comments that uh, ultimately became our last in-person forum in 2020. Professor Juliet Kayyem, Helen Branswell from Time, Dr. Michael Mina, and moderated by Rick Burke, the co-founder and editor of STAT. So bringing them back on this occasion, reflecting on the past three years in Pathways Forward. So with our thanks to our extraordinary panel, thank you all very much for joining us and good night.